together. We started the first women's Alzheimer's prevention center in the world at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Richard was the advisor, and we're expanding that because we have a four-year waiting list to try to get into that. The challenge with a lot of these tests and stuff is insurance won't cover anything that deals with quote-unquote prevention. But Dr. Atia talks in here about the blood tests that you should ask your doctor for, which I have asked my doctor for, which I've always met with, like, you don't actually need all that. We don't. I'm like, trust me, I need it. And then <laughs> Okay, you know, but I think what you're really advocating to all of us is that we need to be in the driver's seat of our health, that uh, medicine 2.0, which is what we've all been living with, uh, kind of makes us passive, it makes us a passenger, so to speak, in our life. And Dr. Tia talks about uh, medicine 3.0. Why don't you define how you see medicine 3.0 and how you really define our role in that? Yeah, I mean, it's probably easier to explain Medicine 2.0 first, but Medicine 2.0, which is the system that we live in, has 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 had a lot of remarkable successes. I won't go back and explain 1.0, but basically Medicine 2.0 is what you would credit for the doubling of human lifespan in the last 150 years. So it basically eradicated the most common causes of death up until 150 years ago, which were largely uh, death due to poor sanitation uh, communicable infectious diseases and infant mortality. And so by addressing those issues, people literally live twice as long now as they did before. However, we haven't really made much progress against chronic diseases. So you rattled off a bunch, but the big ones are what? Heart disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease and dementia, type two diabetes and metabolic disease. Those are still the diseases that are gonna kill most people. If you're listening to us speaking now, this is very likely what you're going to die of. And um, the question is why? Why has the current medical system not had much success against that? And I would argue that in large part, it's because it's focusing on the wrong metrics. So the current medical system focuses on the metric of lifespan and lifespan alone. Every success is measured in length of life. And if you start to expand the, call it the criteria by which you determine success, it's not just length of life, it's quality of life. If you start to really think about quality of life, you realize that you have to start including things in your assessment that go beyond the day you die. It has to be a function of what's your cognitive function, what's your physical function, what's your emotional health, all of those other things. And now all of a sudden, you can't just rely on one tool, right? So the tool of Medicine 2.0 is effectively diagnostic, uh, procedure, uh, right? So it's, so it's, it's like, you know, a surgery, a procedure, a medication. It, it's basically, you know, what we learned in medical school. If you expand that and you include exercise, nutrition, sleep, toolkit around emotional health, you now have a different system and you now have a much longer time horizon of risk. So that's a very clumsy way of sort of explaining that medicine 3.0 involves a much longer time horizon I didn't really explain this part, but you know, I write about it in much more detail. It has to be very personalized yeah. um, because at this level, it's very much about the individual and it has to be evidence informed, but not purely just taking the average of the data set as it rolls out. Um, and it has to, by definition, involve more than just uh, drugs and surgeries. Again, drugs and surgeries are amazing. They've saved a lot of lives. They will continue to but we do have to, as doctors, learn more about nutrition, exercise, sleep, and emotional health. 